Listen. You know it's bad when the studio has no early screenings, barely any Thursday showing since they want to delay the bad reviews from the press, but since Fantasy Island ain't real, that wasn't happening. That said, I do have to put a disclaimer here even though I hate doing so, but every time we cover a Blumhouse film, they manually claim our video. Sometimes they even block it for mere seconds of footage that we legally show since the studio themselves post it up for review purposes. But I guess to them, review purposes means positive only since conveniently, those are the reviews they don't touch. I know the Blumhouse budget is a Subway coupon and a pack of gum, but listen here, Jason. I ain't get either, so chill. Part of making a Blumhouse movie is that you have a very limited budget. We made this movie for $7.2 million. Wow. Which is not a lot of money. Uh, you know, there were no trailers for the cast. No, I didn't have a techno crane one day on this movie. I mean, I had a techno crane on my first movie, which is a million dollar movie. Didn't have any sophisticated filmmaking equipment. Uh, we basically had the gear that we barged over for New from New Zealand. And if anything broke, it was broken. That said, let me explain. Now, Blumhouse as a company is notorious for its budgets, but, you know, they have created a lot of iconic horror films just to run them into the ground. But then they've also produced a bunch of Oscar winners. So having followed their motto and a lot of the behind the scenes for their films, I do have some positive things to say about their motto, but that ain't this video. Now everyone knows nostalgia is one hell of a drug and studios are addicted to adapting old properties in order to expand their streaming collections. And I don't know if it's a budget thing, but they also don't even rename them. They just pull that Thor number one and recycle. And some may argue that it makes sense since it's a reboot and it isn't connected to the... Nah. Nah, I really don't know why they do that. To give you a sense of how fast they cycle these, the idea for Black Christmas was announced June 2019th. They filmed for 27 days, released it in December, and no joke was out at theaters and forgotten by Christmas. It was still so cheap it tripled its budget. So when Blum got hit up about an idea involving an island that fulfills your fantasies gone wrong, dude legit just asked Sony for the rights to the show and got it. Now I'm gonna bash the movie because I don't like it, but I'm not gonna lie. That's kind of badass. What's not badass is making a crappy movie though. Anything and everything is possible. No service. It's not everything is possible. So the original show aired in the 70s, and I'll give director Jeff Wadlow credit for the way he pitches the original pitch. So uh, Aaron Spelling, legendary TV producer, was in the office of the president of ABC Networks at the time, and TV, TV movies were big business back in the 70s. He pitched like 10 ideas, president of ABC passed on all 10. Aaron Spelling gets frustrated and says, what's it gonna take? A movie about an island where you can go and do whoever you want? And the president of ABC said, well, that sounds interesting. And he went and hired Gene Levitt, wrote Fantasy Island, and that's where the show came from. So for the reboot, you know, they keep the same concept. Five people won a contest that isn't really explained so much, but they come to this island to have their craziest wishes fulfilled. There's no cell phone service, none of the staff takes tips or anything like that, but they all get greeted by Michael Pena's Mr. Rourke. Now, I really do like Michael Pena, like, I really, really do like Michael Pena, and I didn't expect them to top Ricardo Montalban's performance from the original. But I didn't expect Homie to play Andy Garcia light either. In the show, his motives were a mystery. You didn't know if he had been there for years or centuries. Was he was he evil? Was he bad? Was he mixed? It's almost like they would eventually base Richard from Lost on him. But Pena's take has him almost being a prisoner to the island because he has to lure the guests in. Had them take that spring water that makes their fantasies come true, even though he said they didn't, in order for the island to grant him the fantasy to see his dead wife. But obviously there's a dark twist, just like with everybody else, and she has to die after every group finishes their fantasies. And that's not a bad idea. And that's the biggest problem I have with the movie. See, the director had done Never Back Down, which I really like. And I don't think the director's concepts for other stuff are bad. Like for Truth, Blumhouse's Truth or Dare. It wasn't a bad idea. Neither is this new one for Fantasy Island. It's just that the execution isn't there. So when it came to Fantasy Island, I don't know whether to blame the low budget or if it's just because they were all on vacation. Uh, but it was in a very remote part of Fiji, and I said to the line producer, that we gotta shoot here. And she was like, well, they don't have the ability to support us there. There's no, there's no, um, there's no hotels, the, the airplanes that can land there are only like 15 seaters. We can't get the equipment there in time. I don't, I don't, we, we can't do it. I mean, the only way we could possibly do it is if we bought out a cruise ship. So we bought out a cruise ship for the first two weeks of photography. We put the cast, the crew on it. We lashed all the gear, the deck. We had the kickoff party on a, on a uh, uh, Saturday night. 
We all went to bed in our cabins. We sailed 17 hours to the other side of Fiji. We woke up and we started shooting. Now there's nothing wrong with pulling a mashup of different genres for it to become four mini movies, which is what they do here with the uh, different you know parties that they have, the different fantasies. But if you barely had the budget for one, yeah, maybe shouldn't have extended it. We follow Lucy Hale as one of the first ones who previously starred in Blumhouse's Truth or Dare. So she comes back here as the innocent girl whose fantasy is justice from all the bullies she had growing up. And I bought it completely. Her segment is definitely the Saw homage because you'll see the colors just change. Like this is all supposed to still be one movie, but the color, like the color correction is different for each one. She's somehow beating this Bane-like figure that was attacking her. She's torturing her bully until she doesn't want to. They're in the woods with the moonlight clearly behind them. Yet they got the soap opera floodlights flooding them from the front. It looks bad sometimes. Her character also comes across Michael Rooker on Fantasy Island who's playing... Michael Rooker on Fantasy Island, and I think he handled his dialogue the best, considering uh, he was sent there to investigate the island, but then got duped into a fantasy of seeing his dead daughter, you know, trapping him there. That's that's all good. But even he's like, wouldn't someone send for me? Considering that later on they actually call for a ride? Yeah, this ain't like the island in Lost. The island's clearly on the map. <laughs> Drax and JD are the most annoying ones in this movie. They're stepbrothers whose fantasy is to you know practically recreate the hangover. And like the hangover, the fantasy goes wrong and they get kidnapped. They even had Jimmy sign an NDA since his character was supposed to be a cameo from the original series. And, you know, while I'm already in the spoiler section, I, I don't want Mr. Blumhouse to flag my video. So instead, I'll just recommend HBO's My Dinner with Irv, which has Dinklage portraying the iconic actor who played Tattoo on Fantasy Island. And uh, no, I'm really recommending it because it's actually a really, really crazy story on his life. And it's a much better movie than this one. As for the brothers, like... I know Jimmy is funny because I've seen him in so many stuff, so I can tell that the punchlines that he was given just weren't there, but I'm at least glad he was able to have fun. We're to pretend like we like acting and like partying yeah. and, you know, pretend like we like the models and stuff yeah. and like we like to hang on Fiji. It, it was tough. A lot of mental preparation went into, you know, just being in Fiji for two months, but I think at the end of the day, all the hard work you put in shows up on the screen. <laughs> Patrick is a cop whose fantasy is to join the military, so they, you know, throw the Private Ryan bleach bypass filter on his segment and have him play Call of Duty. But I'll be honest, I actually, I actually like this one. There's an element to the island where just because you ask for a scenario, it, it's still going to actually read your deepest desires because it's supernatural and give you what you actually want. And again, I think that's a really cool idea and it works in the segment. Um, but as you'll see in a little bit, they just ignore that rule for the others. But in the case of Patrick, where his military fantasy was really to see his father who he lost as a kid one last time before that fatal mission when he passed, that I thought it showed real potential and had a leeway of combining all the stories together. And I'd almost had it if it wasn't for the dumbest final twist. <laughs> So Maggie Q was practically in a Lifetime movie. Her fantasy was to relive a date from years ago and actually say yes to the proposal that she was given, which would then result in like a 51st date scenario where even though she's on the island for two days, on the first day she said yes, the next day she sees the five-year-old she would have had with that guy and all the memories come swooping in. Um, but that's kind of weird. Maybe if the movie wasn't marketed as a straight up horror and it wasn't jumping around too much, this, this could have worked, you know? But then Maggie swaps her fantasy, even though the two rules on the island, the only two rules on the syllabus are one, you can't change your fantasy, and two, once you choose it, you must see it through to the end. And she, I'm not kidding, goes, nah, but the, um, nah, but the island got it wrong. I, I wanted another fantasy deep down in my heart. Bad movie. Bad movie. Doesn't matter. Movie is now down to its last pack of gum, so they decide to combine everything by adding the dumbest last minute subplot it turns out that they had all crossed paths before any of them were on the island because they were living in an apartment building where maggie accidentally caused a fire and even though only one dude died that dude was supposed to go on a tinder date with lucy hale and now she is the one whose fantasy that we never saw was to actually somehow, even though she wouldn't have known they were a part of that accident, even though there were probably other people involved, even though how would she get them onto the island, even though she earlier let her bully escape, meaning she had completely different motives, she dies. It's a dumb twist that they have in the movie of her being the bully, like I said she was, but she dies because it turns out her bully also gets uh, to drink the water, and then a, and then a zombie, um, a zombie snatches Lucy, um, 
This was released in theater. Patrick sadly sacrifices himself, pulling a cap for the crew. Again, Patrick's the best one. The more annoying brother dies, but rules state that if Brax stays on the island, then JD can leave. And not only is that lame because I hated JD, but it's also dumb because the whole thing is forced for, you know, the cameo Jimmy signed on to be. But like when JD leaves after dying and seeing that his brother's gonna leave there, he just salutes him goodbye. Rourke realizes his wife shouldn't keep dying. The living leave to keep trying. And I had never been so happy for credits that I was almost crying. That's why we go to horror movies and ride roller coasters, right? To feel something? Well. I felt ripped off after this one. Thank you guys for watching this movie. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Stay tuned for the follow-up. Their next one, I believe, is on a Magic 8-Ball movie. So, shaking mine right now. Doesn't look like it's going to be good. Um, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on this. Again, not maliciously trying to hate the movie, but there's just some stuff. Look, if, and this, is, and this is the thing that I think a lot of upcoming critics should get, because they get a lot of people. Now with social media, directors, and a lot of people are online, and they'll try to give you crap. Nah. If you're deciding to go the cheap route, so cheap that your movie can make back its budget on a $5 Tuesday, and you're going more so for the monetary praise, then that's where you're, that's where you're gonna get it from. You're not gonna get critical praise. If that's what you're going for, don't feel bad bashing a movie, especially when you're paying the money to go see it. That's why I always go pay the money to go, well, they didn't even have press screenings for this one, uh, but I always go pay the money to go see these movies because you're not gonna manipulate my opinion. Truth or Dare, which got manually hit for plagiarism, our, our older video, just to wrap that up there. Uh, supposedly we had used the full reference, Master of the Movie, even though um, you know, we had it, but we chose to choose trailer footage. It doesn't make any sense, but to keep it even though you're accusing up of plagiarism, to keep the video up, I have my analytics so I can see that you guys boosted the video, added your own ads. Like, I'm not your PR team. I think that's the part that really upsets me as well. Um, and then to see like you're not even putting effort into these movies and it's that cheap. I haven't made a Why It Sucks video in such a, like since the A to Z show. So look, again, if that's the business model you're going for, fine. But don't expect good reviews. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe or Blumhouse will claim you. You know, part of making a Blumhouse movie is that you have a very limited budget. Why don't we buy out a cruise ship? So we bought out a cruise ship for the first two weeks of photography.